good morning. Um, thanks for tuning in today. Um, my name is Georgi Tuba. I'm a research associate with Merck at, um, at Laurentia. And I've been working on an alteration study in the larger Lake Virginia town area. So in the next about 25 minutes, I will, um, I will walk you through this study and the preliminary results. And first I will give you an introduction on the study. And then mostly I will be focusing on the Kerr Edison deposit itself. And um, the, the specific target of this, of this uh, presentation will be the alteration paragenesis and mineralization that we can uh, observe there. And later on in the second half, I will, um, I will explain how to translate these petrographic observation into something that can be used as an exploration tool. So how we can use these for geochemical mapping at the Kerr Edison site. And at the end, I will give you a, a summary and a glimpse into what we plan for the future in terms of the future work. Um, so um, we all know that the uh, orogenic deposits come in all shapes and sizes. And um, one of the problems that we don't quite understand is the, um, is the question of gold endowment, specifically why it can be so variable um, among deposits that basically have the same geological makeup and the same geological environment. So a very good example for this is um, the, um, the Larder Lake Virginia Town segment of the Larder Lake Cadillac Deformation Zone, where we have a series of gold deposits, as Kate uh, introduced us to this, this um, area. And um, along this 12 kilometer segment, um, we have these gold deposits that are very variably endowed in gold although they are situated in the same uh, structural framework and also they have the same um, host rocks. So we have deposits like McGarry that was a really, really small deposit. And then on the other end of the spect spectrum, we have Kerr Edison that produced over 11 million ounces of gold um, as with, combined with the Gesterfield mine that it's basically the same deposit anyway. Um, so uh, the question is why they are so uh, drastically different in gold endowment and we approach this question from an alteration point of view. So we are wondering whether there can be a difference in the alteration style or in intensity or maybe it's the fluid flux or the fluid mass that percolated in these systems that, that uh, resulted in, in such a big difference in gold endowment. So. Um, as for general workflow, we have two phases set up for this study. And in the first phase, we will take a very good look at uh, the well and out end of the spectrum. So that would be the Kerr Edison deposit. And we can do so because the present owner of the, uh, of the mine site, uh, Gold Candle um, Limited, granted us access to the surface and also to their geochemical database, which is invaluable for this study. And uh, once we get a good good understanding on, of, on what's going on with Kerr, we can compare Kerr to, to less endowed deposits. So we have Chamonix and Omega lined up for this, but there's, an, there's also a very important second stage of this project. And this is to get a good look at the barren segments of the larger Lake Cadillac uh, deformation zone. And this is very important. And this is very much in line with the core focus of, of Mellow Earth. So that we don't exclude um, areas that do not have the gold um, so that we can have a full, um, full understanding on, on the full spectrum um, from the, the barren um, areas to, to the well endowed areas in terms of alteration and, and fluid mass. So, um, the geology of the Curedison deposit is, is really, uh, it's quite simple actually. Um, so the deposit is hosted by larger lake volcanic units, mainly ultramafic and, and mafic volcanic units. And the deposit lies in the footwall of the larger lake Cadillac deformation zone. So everything is south of it. And, um, and it's basically the, ho the whole Curedison um, area is, is the damage zone of the larger lake Cadillac deformation zone. North of the, of the structure, we have Temiskaming and Blake River formations, but they are not mineralized. And we have younger faults uh, cutting 
the um, the volcanic packages that occur, and and one of the more important ones, or most important ones, is the Kerr fault, and everything is of course um, covered uh, by uh, sorry by um, the Archean packages are covered by Huronian sediments in the south. So for the alteration, um, it was recognized in the 1980s and 1990s that there's a certain uh, zoning, alteration zoning around the, the now historic deposits. And this is a map I produced in 2019 after a field season um, where I mapped um, the alteration in a series of trenches uh, highlighted by these triangles. And these trenches were put in by Gold Candle in 2015. So these give a very good surface overview on the ultra mafic unit and what's going on there with, with in terms of alteration. So we see that um, there's a very um, very strong potassic envelope around in, in close proximity to to the historic ore bodies. And as we as we leave the zone, we a transact a, a chloride carbonate alteration zone and the talc alteration zone. So as for the, the, the other main host, the mafic volcanic units, those are not very well exposed on the surface. So I was looking at um, drill core too, to sort of get, a, get the full picture of, uh, of alteration systematics in both the ultra mafic and the, and the mafic units. Now, historically, there are three different types of mineralization distinguished that occur. And um, the first, the one type would be the green carbonate ultramafic or the green carbonate uh, ore, uh, which uh, got its name because it is hosted by this very fluxidic, uh, very green ultramafic uh, unit. But mostly the gold, the, the, the majority of the gold is present as free gold, as VG in uh, large quartz carbonate vein systems and vein rays. In contrast to that, the other one, the flow ore, is, uh, is hosted by, by mafic volcanic units and uh, or dominantly mafic volcanic units. And this is a disseminated pyrite or xenopyrite um, uh, sort of uh, mineralization, and it is associated with very strong albite alteration. Now, there was a third type of, of um, mineralization distinguished, and these are the so-called albatite dikes, and those are a little bit obscure, um, but geochemistry tells us that these are dikes of dominantly intermediate to phasic uh, uh, origin or protolith, but now at their present state, they are completely albite altered, and they have a very similar style of mineralization than the, um, the flow or in the mafic volcanic. So these dikes can be anywhere from a few meters in, in width to down to the centimeter scale. And I am not gonna talk about these in detail in this presentation, but just keep in mind that whatever I say about the flow or that goes with the, with the, um, the albatite dikes too. Oops. So, um, so in the following, I will be focusing on the alteration sequence proximal to historic ore bodies because of time constraints and because, because gold fluids are more interesting than non-gold fluids. So basically, the alteration sequence can be distinguished into three main alteration events. And I lumped everything that comes before the gold uh, event into under the pre-orogenic alteration umbrella. So these are these are basically the that's the regional background that we, we that we can observe. And then the orogenic phase itself turns out that this is a multi-stage alteration. So within the orogenic phase, within the, the gold bearing phase, we can distinguish four different stages which overlap a little bit in time, but there's a very good temporal sequence to them. And then I will also touch on a post orogenic alteration, um, which, which, um, which comes with an excess of uh, calcium carbonate in the system. So taking a little bit closer look, um, for the pre-orogenic alteration, we, we mostly have um, that traces or, or evidence that such as that uh, there was a serpentinization of the ultramafic. So sometimes we see relict olivine pseudomorphs and, and we have um, magnetite and chromite as inclusions in inclusion planes in this relict, um, relict um, um, phases. And uh, every now and then we have the old chrome spinel, but really not much is remaining from the ultramafic. But the more important um, 
and the more uh, widespread alteration is is a strong chloride alteration that affected both ultramafic and mafic units. Now, the orogenic phase, on the other hand, is a highly selective alteration. And it is it's a very, very exciting alteration. So um, it's a selective multistage alteration with an evolving fluid. And that means that um, the, same, the same fluid composition, the same fluid flux and, and stage can result in very different alteration assemblages depending on, on it and if it encounters uh, an ultramafic unit or a mafic unit. So in the first stage where the main compounds are sodium and, and CO2 in, in the fluid system, um, the resulting alteration assemblage can be a strong carbonatization or a carbonatization with sodic alteration. So this stage results in very strong magnesium rich um, and also iron bearing carbonate alteration in, in the ultramafic, whereas in the mafic unit, it accounts for a very, very strong sodic alteration with calcium carbonate um, present. And both of them have some, some quartz and, and chloride. But these are two very, very different uh, immune assemblages caused by the same, same fluid. Um, the next stage is the sulfidation. So the ultramafic unit is not very susceptible uh, to, to sulfidation, which means that um, the floor and, and, and basically a disseminated pyrite is usually um, not very abundant and not very present in ultramafic unit, whereas this is the main the main uh, mineralization style in the in the mafic unit. But uh, nevertheless, if pyrite occurs in in ultramaf in the ultramafic unit, it looks texturally and and pyrogenesis wise, it looks exactly the same, like um, like the like the the floor in the mafic unit. So the system starts out with uh, the pyrite starts out with this very porous, very corroded core, which is low in arsenic. And in the subsequent um, time frame, we have an evolution in in uh, in the elements basically that are present in in uh, in the system. So after after the very um, porous core. Um, we have a very solid inclusion-free mantle in both in both ultramafic and uh, mafic unit, and this mantle it tends to be higher in arsenic, and in the ultramafic unit it tends to um, uh, have um, inclusions of, of high arsenic minerals, mostly gerstorphite, which is a nickel nickel arsenide mineral. And um, in the mafic unit, it, the, the solid pyrite is actually intergrown with arsenopyrite. So um, the other thing that we can observe here is that in the beginning, the earlier stages or the earlier um, um, that stages of the sulfidation, um, the trace, trace minerals, the trace uh, mineral sulfides uh, uh, source their elements from the host. So that means that in the ultramafic, we have, we have pyrite, calcopyrite, some calcopyrite and copper nickel sulfides mostly. And that translates to cocopyrite and sphalerite in, in the mafic volcanic unit. And after that, there's, there's um, an introduction of arsenic. And we have gerstorphite overgrowing the whole system. This is where gold appears too. And, um, and the same goes for, for the volcanic unit. And after the, the arsenic stage, we have the, the uh, appearance of, of antimony. And um, so the gold in, in the mafic volcanic unit tends to be associated mostly with, with this gerstorphite and tetrahedrite um, and other um, antimony bearing minerals. So this stage where we have the arsenic and the antimony also leads us to, uh, to the potassic alteration. These overlap in time. And also this is the stage where we, where we um, shifts from a host buffered system to a fluid buffered system. So in the potassic alteration stage, um, even though we have two different um, host rocks, the alteration itself in the stage looks very, very similar. So basically this is, this is a dominance of, of potassic mica, which is fuchsite in the ultramafic unit because there's a little bit, little bit of chromite and sericite in the mafic volcanic unit. And in both cases, these are associated with um, with the uh, gerstorphite and the gerstorphite is a little bit uh, more iron enriched in the mafic volcanic unit. Now the last stage is the emplacement of quartz carbonate veining 
And as I said, in the green carbonate um, system, the green carbonate ore, these veins are the, the primary host for, for gold. But there's a very interesting feature if we take a closer look how the gold is actually, how, how it appears in these veins. So what we see is that um, very nicely shaped, very euhedral um, gold crystals and gold droplets are sit situated um, along grain boundary migration and, and the subgrain zones in these, in these quartz veins. So that means that um, even though the gold is actually hosted by the, quart the quartz veins, texturally, it's not coeval with it. And I will, I will come back to this, this fact a little bit later on. So um, the last stage is the posterogenic phase. And um, that's a very, very not interesting uh, alteration type in terms of when it appears in veins. So that there are very non-deformed um, veins that cut through all the, um, the, the fabric or, or, or the, the former quartz veins. And they are characterized by a, a, a calcium carbonate infill. But another, another uh, feature, another uh, occurrence of the calcium carbonate actually is um, in the same gold bearing uh, quartz veins we were talking about. And how they appear is that when we take a look, the calcium carbonate actually is intergrown with again, very nice looking uh, gold grains. And this calcium carbonate takes advantage of these, these grain boundaries and these, these um, subgrain zones in the quartz. So, so there's a re replacement, a late replacement going on, which, which raises the question whether this gold that we see here may be either partially or maybe fully remobilized by a later posterogenic uh, hydrothermal event. Now, after, after uh, going through the, um, the, the petrography and, and uh, the alteration perigenesis, let's see how we can translate this to something that can be readily used for exploration. So uh, alteration indices are, are a very common tool to, to do so. And we have a very nice long list of alteration minerals. We can, we can set up a very well-behaved element um, perigenesis based on this too. And, um, but there are certain things that we have to keep in mind when we set up these, these alteration indices to, to be used. So the indices have to accommodate the different things. First, they have to be, um, uh, they, 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 they mustn't be sensitive to host rocks. So they have to be, they have to accommodate different host rocks. And of course they have to be able to, to uh, distinguish between multiple super, superimposed alteration events and stages. And very importantly, they have to accommodate the analytical methods that are commonly used in an industry setting. So, CO2, for example, would be a very nice choice to, to gauge the, um, the, um, uh, the strength of carbonate alteration, the intensity of carbonate alteration, but CO2 is not usually incorporated or, or included in, in um, the, um, the industry or the assay packages in an industry setting. And same with, with um, silica, for example. So I, don't, I, I shouldn't use that. I cannot use, use that to, to uh, set up the uh, alteration indices with. But there are some elements that I, I, I can use and I will show you how a little bit later. And um, so I can set up these alteration indices and I can, um, I can um, um, use um, some, trace, some pathfinders with them to, 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 um, for exploration too. So how, um, how I came up with the alteration indices. I basically used two different discrimination diagrams and the one on the left, the alkali uh, aluminum diagram is not my brainchild. This, this is a known, um, discrimination diagram, but tailored to, to Kerr, what we can do with it is that we can discriminate between gold associated versus the barren preorganic alteration. So the chloride alteration field, that's, that's where we don't have the gold, that's the, the, the background, the basic um, uh, barren alteration. And then we have the potassium alteration and the sodic alteration that are of the alteration stage, stages of interest. I like to divide them up a little bit so that I can gauge the intensity within these group a, a little bit more. And then I also use this ternary, ternary that is based on the observations, the, the petrographic observations and the mineral chemistry. 
that um, that um, for for which I collected data. And what this does is it discriminates between gold associated and costergenic alteration events. So it will show us whether a system has additional calcium in it, which, which we can attribute to the late car carbonate alteration. And what we can do is we can plot all our data. So this is about 3000 data points from the gold candle surface and diamond drill hole uh, database, and we can color code them. And once we have color coded them, we can put them on a map or 3D space. I'm just gonna show you the maps now. I'm not going into 3D, but, but it's the exact same thing. So color coding creates this very messy, very busy um, map, but we can put in uh, density contours, for example. And so this is the density contouring for all the uh, or all the samples, regardless of alteration types. And this is just showing how, how, what the um, the sample distribution is. So it's it's obviously very biased because we are not sampling around around the grid, but it's it's we have to be aware of the of the distribution of the samples basically. And we can choose after this, we can choose what alteration types to actually. Um, plot and take a look at. So in this, this diagram, in this image, I chose the chloride alteration. And uh, what these highlights show, these centers show, is that these are the areas that were not overprinted by the alteration types of interest. So sodic and potassic alteration. If we compare this to the potassic and sodic uh, alteration map, we see that there are hotspots, which are, which are different from uh, the, of course, the, the chloride alteration uh, pattern. And uh, you can use these to, to select areas to create drill targets or create surface targets. Because you know where the, the uh, alteration of interest is the strongest or you know, the, the areas that are perspective for that. We can do the same thing with the carbonate alteration types. And if we compare the early carbonate alteration, so the basically the, uh, the orogenic phase to the late carbonate overprint, there's a very interesting thing that we can observe. If we plot the, the structures, we see that along the larger Lake Cadillac deformation zone, there was no late carbonate overprint at all. So, so this, this fluid is not, so this, this structure is not a conduit for that fluid. But if we put in the curve fault, for example, we see that, that the centers line up very well with the curve fold. This works in 3D too, which I'm not gonna show you now, but it does. And uh, we see that the curve fold is probably one of the conduits for this late calcium carbonate alteration. And it actually is uh, confirmed in the field. It was confirmed in the field that, that it does have a calcium rich alteration with it. And it was mentioned uh, um, uh, in, when the mining was going on, that the curve fault actually remobilizes gold. Whether this is mechanical or geochemical, we don't know, but it, but it does. So what you can use the, the late carbonate overprint map for, for example, is to highlight whether you have faults uh, at depth that you, you didn't see or you didn't pick it up, and, um, and it may have some implications for gold remobilization as we saw. So in summary, the Curedison deposit is a result of a multiphase alteration event. And the three, well, I think through two main mineralization styles are uh, the result of a host stroke um, dependent selective alteration in the presence of the same, in the presence of the same fluid at shifting fluid rock ratios. And we can use alteration indices that, that, uh, that are, can be used to assess the quality and intensity of barren versus gold associated alteration in a, a geospatial environment. And they highlight upflow centers and are readily applicable in an industry setting. Now for future work, what I would still like to do at Curedison is to address the question of genetic and temporal link between the, the disseminated and the, the, the vein type um, mineralization. So I'm I'm interested in whether part or maybe most of the the vein time mineralization is a, a result of remobilization, and I would also like to translate the semi quantitative alteration indices to something about to numbers basically. So I, so I would do the mass balance calculations to express the alteration intensity in terms of mass flux. And in phase two, as I said before, we will compare this whole package to, to less endowed systems. So we will do similar studies at uh, Omega and Chamonix um, 
supplemented by literature data. And hopefully in 2020, we will have a field season with a, a sample, sampling campaign along the whole 12 kilometers of the, of the Lardell Lake, um, Cadillac Deformation Zone. Uh, within Lauder Lake and Virginia Town, where we can where we can assess what we have at the barren areas and do the same sort of geochemical mapping that we did at Kerr. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Yorgi. Uh, any questions for Yorgi? Uh, there's a one in the chat room here. Any comments why the fluid evolves to more arsenic rich? To more arsenic rich in like generally or in one in one system or in the in the ultramafic or or the mafic. Eugene, maybe you can comment. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, it, it was it, so you had the um, the arsenic rich uh, cores, uh, sorry, arsenic rich mantles to the pyrite. Um, yeah. And 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 wherever that was found. I was just curious. I mean, we see that in so many places like Timmins and other places. So, uh, but it's just curious, like from a genetic point of view or just thinking, um, you know, why, why we might have that fluid, uh, the evolution of the chemistry of the fluid. Well, I think, um, I think it's um, partly due, the source of the arsenic is interesting. It, it may be because of sediments um, or something like that. But the, the fluid evolution may be just due to the, um, the selective um, um, fixing of elements. So in the first stage, you, you fix certain elements and then, and then um, iron, so sulfur readily reacts with, with um, the available iron. And then once you drop the iron levels, you, you relatively raise the arsenic levels so you can, you can drop out the arsenic. What I, I didn't have time to show is that the iron is also sourced from the rock, so it's not in the fluid. And in, in the um, the mythic volcanic units, it's it's very visible because because the the um, the, um, the pyrite and orzino pyrite actually has a halo of of um, chloride degradation around it, so you can see that the the background mass is albite, calcium carbonate, and chloride. And where you have the, um, the sulfides, iron is gone. So, so you use the iron, but once it's not that available, you shift to, to drop out other elements, for example, arsenic, and then you drop out the antimony. And also if you, so that can also be uh, like a supply of elements from, from uh, lower stratigraphic, stratigraphic uh, levels, you know, as more and more fluid uh, washes through um, to deeper, deeper settings, and you mobilize more, more uh, elements from the deeper settings, and then you trap them at higher settings subsec subsequently. So, so something like that. Yeah, no, that <clears throat> thank you. That uh, it's fascinating because it, it sort of uh, presents an opportunity to have different indices. In yeah, so that's, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's very- uh, I have a question. Okay, oh, yeah. Sure. You go ahead, Eric. Um, you show a photo of, uh, in the Mafic of pyrite, but there was some inclusion of arsenic. So why do you say arsenic came after? So what happens with the, the Mafic volcanic unit, and this also goes for the ultra Mafic, um, the pyrite has this very, very constant uh, texture, right? So in the in the, the core, it's very spongy, it's very um, um, inclusion rich, it's corroded actually. And if you take a look at this this um, um, SCM photo, you see that the, the core, the overprinted core or the corroded core is low in arsenic, right? So in the early stage okay. of the sulfidation, you don't have the arsenic um precipitated basically you you still have it in the fluid and then in the mantle the mantle is completely solid it doesn't have this spongy corroded appearance and um my monitor cuts out every now and then I okay don't know. I, I was referring to a photo just before i think 
Yeah, this one. You see, there's this some one? kind of a yeah, inclusion, so, or is just on yes, the it is. So this, but but keep in mind that this pyrite on the photo, that's a solid one. So that's okay. not the that's not uh, texturally, it's not coeval to 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 this guy, the the core. So this okay, is so this, this could be a late pyrite. Stage. Yeah, and that stage it is intergrown with arzino pyrite in the in the mafic volcanic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other further questions? There's a couple here in the in the chat room, but uh, any live ones? Uh, Ross, this this is Mark. Um, any feeling as to why keratosin is the better asset in this trend? The better one? The biggest yeah. one. Why is, it, why is it the biggest one? That's a good question. Um, that's one of the questions we have in this study. Um, so far, where the study stands is we, we understand what's going on at Kerr, but we still have to compare it to, to less endowed systems, right? So um, that's that's going on. That will be going on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, Georgi, maybe you can. Answer, there's a, there's a bunch of questions in the chat room. Maybe you can address them as uh, Zuzi starts up. Um, um, yes. Stop right. sharing the screen. Yeah. 